I've been watching the confirmation process for the Supreme Court nominees for a long time. The first confirmation hearing which I can recall is that of Robert Bork, who was nominated to replace Justice Lewis Powell in 1987. I have watched ever since because this process is a critical function of the Senate, as well it should be. The justices of the Supreme Court sit until they retire or die in office. Since 1970, the average tenure of a justice is well over 20 years. In that time, they will shape a lot of critical law. When our society discusses issues politely with each side seeking a peaceful resolution, everyone benefits. When the discussion is a highly polarized shouting match between people who just don't listen to each other, well, it's time for some roasted opinions. In 1991, Judge Clarence Thomas faced a tough confirmation fight. During the course of the hearings, he was accused by law professor Anita Hill of sexual harassment, which occurred when she worked for him at the Department of Education and the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The nation was focused on the hearings and the salacious allegations, which resulted in one of the narrowest confirmation margins in the history of the United States. In 2005, Judge Samuel Alito faced similarly contentious hearings despite a rating of well-qualified from the American Bar Association. Senator John Kerry attempted to filibuster the confirmation vote. The principal raised during the hearings was his association with concerned alumni of Princeton. Judge Alito disavowed the group publicly during the hearings over their positions. In 2016, Judge Neil Gorsuch was nominated to replace Justice Antonin Scalia. Again, he was rated well qualified by the ABA, and again, the confirmation vote was narrow. At issue was the passages from Gorsuch's book, The Future of Assisted Suicide and Euthanasia, which were alleged to be plagiarized. Gorsuch's confirmation was filibustered until the Senate invoked the so-called nuclear option and revised Senate rules to allow a simple majority cloture vote on Supreme Court nominations. Of the current members of the court, three have been confirmed by less than 60 votes. Thomas, Alito, and Gorsuch. Justices Kagan, Sotomayor, Breyer, and Bader Ginsburg were all confirmed more comfortably. So was Chief Justice Roberts, the only member of the court nominated by a Republican to be confirmed by more than 58 votes. All four of the retired members of the Supreme Court were confirmed by at least 90 affirmative votes. They only have a total of nine votes against them in their confirmations, all against Justice Davis de Souter, who was nominated in 1990. Starting with the Souter confirmation, no recent Supreme Court justice has been confirmed unanimously. That might not seem very odd, but before Souter, several justices were confirmed unanimously. Over the history of the court, Many justices were confirmed by acclamation, a voice vote with no formal head count. Only 11 nominations in the history of the United States have been rejected by a floor vote in the Senate. 11 others have been withdrawn by the President, principally because the nominee declined. 113 justices have served on the court. Only 30 nominees have never served on the court once nominated. One of them was Judge Merrick Garland, nominated by Barack Obama to replace Justice Antonin Scalia. The Republican Senate refused to convene confirmation hearings on the nomination, leaving the seat vacant for more than a year. Before Merrick Garland, no seat had remained vacant for over a year since Justice Samuel Miller replaced Justice Peter Daniel in 1862. So why exactly is this happening? Merrick Garland is actually pretty easily explained. Justices Sotomayor and Kagan were recommended by Obama specifically to maintain the ideological balance of the court, but they are both activist judges and liberal. Garland is also an activist and a liberal, and he would have replaced Justice Scalia, a very conservative judge who often wrote strict constructionist opinions. Garland would have changed the balance of the court from four liberals, four conservatives, and a moderate swaying vote to five liberals, three conservatives, and a moderate. With the timing of Scalia's death, the Republicans in Congress rolled the dice to try to get a friendly president and preserve the balance of ideologies on the court. President Obama protested, and Congressional Democrats denounced the delayed vote. 
They figured that partisan tactics would help them to win the White House again and pick up the Senate. It might even give them the House, if they made it a big deal. Naturally, it was mentioned almost daily as a great injustice to Judge Merrick Garland, with a few racist allegations tossed in to motivate moderates to support the Dem candidates, especially the presumptive shoo-in candidate for the White House. The American voters said something else about Hillary Clinton in November 2016. Um, no. Just, no. Justices Gorsuch, Alito, and Thomas were virulently opposed. I believe that part of the reason for the tactics used was because they worked on Robert Bork. Another reason was because compelling the confirmation of more moderate justices would in theory create more swing votes and change the ideological balance of the court in favor of the liberal justices. We keep coming to that, the ideological balance of the Supreme Court. Justice Kennedy has retired. He was the moderate swing vote on the court. Judge Kavanaugh's record suggests that he is firmly on the conservative side of the court. That will shift the court more conservative overall, although it will also leave the court somewhat more polarized. Kavanaugh is also 53, which will probably mean that he will be sitting on the Supreme Court for a couple of decades if confirmed. Further, the two oldest members of the court are Justice Bader Ginsburg and Justice Breyer both appointed by President Clinton and both in their 80s. The next oldest member and senior associate justice is Justice Thomas, age 70. If President Trump is re-elected in 2020, there is a good to excellent chance that the composition of the Supreme Court will be six Republican appointees to three Democrat appointees, perhaps even seven to two. Such a court could have a profound negative impact on the progressive agenda. Given that potential, there's certainly a vested interest for progressives ensuring that no more conservative nominees are confirmed. When the nominees are rated highly by the American Bar Association, what reasons would work to shut down a nomination? Judge Bork lost based on strong opposition from the NAACP and ACLU. But the passionate speech by Senator Ted Kennedy to the Senate ended his chances entirely. Senator Kennedy claimed that every progressive step for civil rights for the previous 20 years would be overturned by Bork if he was confirmed. Justice Thomas nearly missed being confirmed based on sexual harassment claims. The FBI investigated the claims and closed the case in three days. During the hearings, evidence was produced that Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas met, dined, and spoke by phone repeatedly after she left her position at the EEOC. Conduct certainly atypical to someone who is a victim of harassment. Now I know that I haven't mentioned Harriet Myers, former White House counsel and Supreme Court nominee. That's because Harriet Myers was completely unqualified to be an associate justice and rightfully rejected by both sides of the aisle in the Senate. But the tactics employed against Bork, Thomas, Alito, Gorsuch, and now Kavanaugh are disturbing. They rise to the level of character assassination, going far beyond mere vetting. The allegations against Kavanaugh are particularly curious. See, it's a timing thing. The timing of the revelation of the initial allegation of attempted rape was right before the scheduled confirmation vote. Senator Dianne Feinstein, the ranking Democrat on the Senate Judiciary Committee, immediately demanded a delay and more hearings. Senator Chuck Grassley moved quickly to schedule such hearings, to which Judge Kavanaugh agreed. Yet his accuser initially insisted on a full investigation by the FBI before she would appear before the Senate Judiciary Committee. That's changed, but we'll get there. I don't believe that Senator Grassley would have allowed such a delay, especially since it might have taken weeks, even months, to complete the investigation. The media may claim that Republicans are trying to push through the confirmation before they lose the Senate, but it could equally be argued that Democrats are trying to delay the nomination until they have a chance to regain the Senate. It could also be argued that the Democrat response to the Trump nominees is payback for Merrick Garland, who interestingly served on the same Court of Appeals as Brett Kavanaugh. These two judges often found themselves dissenting each other's positions when they worked together. As of Monday morning, we have a hearing scheduled. Thursday, September 27th, we will hear what Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh both have to say. Also, as of Monday morning, we now have a second accusation. Deborah Ramirez, a Yale classmate, 
now claims that Kavanaugh exposed himself to her at a dorm party in 1983 or 1984. Michael Avenatti, the lawyer for Stormy Daniels, claims that he could produce a third alleged victim within the next 48 hours. Kavanaugh vehemently denies these allegations, stating that he looks forward to clearing his name. It's entirely possible that the allegations are true, but I doubt it. The timing is just too perfect in my opinion. Given the elapsed time, these allegations won't result in criminal charges against Kavanaugh, but they could tank the nomination and prevent the realignment of the Supreme Court. And all that it will cost is the reputation of one judge with an impeccable record. What's the value of the reputation of one person compared to that? It seems that all the stops are being pulled by the same party which shrugs at similar allegations against Bill Clinton. Oh, and speaking of allegations, has anyone heard about Representative Keith Ellison, the deputy chairperson of the DNC, and the allegations of domestic violence against him? I didn't think so. This strikes me as a full court press smear campaign. It's starting to bring out the greatest political minds, like Mia Farrow. She is disgusted by the alleged actions of Kavanaugh and thinks that he should withdraw from consideration. Of course, she also claimed in the same breath that Justice Thomas should resign because Anita Hill alleged that he sexually harassed her, and Clarence Thomas is currently the senior associate justice on the court. Why bring up discrediting allegations again more than 25 years after he was confirmed and the allegations were found to be less than credible, except because he is an extremely conservative justice. Elections have consequences, and Congress currently has a GOP majority in both houses to go with the GOP president in the White House. Why are the Democrats in Congress acting as if they have the upper hand? To me, it seems that they still believe the hype in the mainstream media. Clinton actually won the White House. The results of the 2016 election were a fluke. America doesn't really want a conservative government. And the polls all tell them that there will be enough change in 2018 to impeach the president, his appointees, and probably Elon Musk, too. It's the blue wave! Except that the RNC has outraised the DNC by leaps and bounds. So maybe that blue wave will come from more than a few Democrats as they say goodbye to Washington, D.C. Only a polarizing issue that will galvanize a huge portion of the electorate to vote Democrat will offset the fundraising differential, which is in the tens of millions in favor of the RNC. Even if Kavanaugh is confirmed, the backlash could swing a lot of votes for Democrats in a listen and believe climate. The blue wave that the media has been talking about isn't spontaneous, really. A lot more Democrat blue Senate seats are at risk than GOP red and the economy is improving. A good economy favors the president's party, normally, and the president is Republican. It seems then that the tail is wagging the dog again. Problems, both domestic and international, are getting addressed. Progress towards a strong and stable America is happening as we speak. But the screams about how fascist the elected government is are getting louder. Support the president or his policies openly, and you too can be called a fascist, a racist, a sexist, an ableist, an ageist, a homophobe, a transphobe, a xenophobe, a deplorable person, and all without your accusers knowing anything about you at all. They only know that you like it when taxes go down, the stock market goes up, more jobs are created, real wages rise, and far fewer people think that there are no solutions to the problems that America faces without forcing every conservative still in office to sit down, shut up, and let the adults run the country. My theory has been and remains that the blue wave will be more of a purple tide. I think that the Senate will shift a little more conservative and the House will not shift far enough to the left to change the balance of political power. Combine that with the conservative Supreme Court and President Donald Trump and I honestly think that the midterms could cut the legs out from underneath the progressives entirely in the 2020 general election. If the predictions and polling data are as far off as they were in November 2016, we might just see the end of legacy media outlets as valid sources of anything but the latest progressive manifestos. I'm glad that we're having the hearing on Thursday. Either the allegations against Kavanaugh will be found credible, or they will be declared unfounded. 
The critical part is to see if Chuck Grassley and the other 10 Republican senators can handle the questioning of Kavanaugh's accusers with the seriousness and sensitivity warranted, and if Kavanaugh sounds honest when he refutes the allegations. If his accusers are credible, then it's only right for his nomination to be rejected or withdrawn, but that credibility has to be judged based on the same legal standards that are applied all over America. I've heard that he can produce a calendar that proves that he could not have been at the party where he allegedly attacked Dr. Ford, and witnesses who will testify that he is innocent of that allegation. I wonder if he can also produce evidence and witnesses that exonerate him regarding the dorm party at Yale University. I also wonder if another alleged victim will come forward before the confirmation vote. Now that's just my opinion, and you don't have to agree with me. In fact, I'd love to hear what you think, so go ahead and give me a like or dislike and comment below. If you like this content and want to see more, feel free to subscribe and make sure that you ring the notification bell. New episodes of Roasted Opinions post on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8pm Central Time. Join me on the last Saturday of every month when I invite guests to join me in the kitchen. New content is coming, so watch this space.